This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotny. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day, wherever you're listening from, and welcome. It's IAQ Radio, and this week we, we're coming from down under. Actually, we aren't, but our guests are. This week, we welcome Ashley Easterby and Penny Trelaw. We're going to talk about the restoration industry down under and go over some of the things they learned on their trip here recently to the United States, kind of compare and contrast a little bit and learn from each other. Before we do, we've got to stop and thank our marquee sponsors. IAQ Radio marquee sponsors are John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Healthy Indoor Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions are available at IAQ.net. Particles Plus, engineers and manufacturers feature rich particle counters, air quality monitoring, instrumentation, and vacuum pump technology. ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man with this week's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry to report there was no correct answer to last week's IAQ Radio Trivia Question, identifying Terry Brennan, Michael Clark, and, and Lou Harriman as the three primary contributors to the EPA's moisture control guidance for building design, construction, and maintenance document. The IQ radio question for today, Friday, March 23, 2018, has been sponsored by Ideas, the solution chemistry company creating unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Here is today's trivia question. Why are the kangaroo and emu chosen to hold the shield in Australia's coat of arms? Back to you, Joe. Thank you, Cliff. Okay, we've got Penny Trelau. She's uh, back, got nine years of restoration and remediation services, uh, beginning of work primarily water loss, but quickly became interested and specialized in mold. She's got a unique approach to mold, providing unbiased assessments to homeowners, builders, and insurance companies. She's also a founding member and secretary of the Indoor Air Quality Association of Australia and a council member of the Restoration Industry Associate. All right, Ashley Easterby is also joining us. He's got over 38 years of experience as an owner and operator of a small business in Australia, an extensive understanding of the need to build and maintain successful relationships and strategic alliances. Um, I wanted to mention here, let's see, over about uh, 2002, I think it was, Ashley started, uh, is instrumental in the formation of a group of like-minded water damage restoration companies into the leading independent restoration network in Australia. The network provides restoration services with national coverage for the needs of corporate clients and insurance companies via a transparent, local, and cost-effective service. So welcome to the show, Ashley and Penny. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks for having us. Wonderful. Hello. Good to see you, Joe. What time is it there? And thank you for joining us late at night. Um, it's 2 to 3 in the morning in Australia, so we really appreciate you two joining us, and uh, we're looking forward to a great show. So what? What? let's start out with what brought you to the States here recently. I understand you, you went to the RIA conference. Um, Ashley, you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, we came over and there's a bunch of Aussies came over and we went to the, uh, to the RIA conference in Austin, Texas, which was really good. And then afterwards, we planned to, to go to another conference in Florida. That didn't quite work out, but ended up, Penny and I ended up there uh, down in Florida and we decided to hook up with Pete and just have a look around and visit some of the members and visit some of the RIA family while we we're there. It was great. And, you know, I, I know, Ashley, you've been doing this for years. Um, how many years have you been coming to the States for restoration, conferences, trainings? Too many. <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably, 
probably getting close to 15, 20. 15 to 20 years. And Penny, welcome. It's great to see you. I, I've met you several times. Always enjoy talking with you. And um, I, I'm wondering how, how often have you been to the States now? Is this first, well, second, third, fifth? No, no, I'm on about my eighth. That was about my eighth trip, I think. Eighth trip? And yeah. what, why is it? It seems like we get more Aussies every year uh, coming over for these events. I, I assume in part it's because, um, you know, this, the biggest events occur here in the States. But what else do you guys, you know, what other... Um, there's, a, there's a core group of us that have been coming and doing some training. Um, we've been done, done some of the advanced ICRC training. And then most recently, a couple of us have done um, the RAA advanced training. So... You know, there's a core group of us have now gone through quite a few of the RAA designations. That's and right. Okay. So, yeah. and I know Pete Consigli, our Restoration Industries Global Watchdog, who will be joining us today. Um, I understand he was part in part your tour guide this time. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> our, our tour guide and food guide. And food guide, yes. Pete likes his food. Uh, he's, uh, he's quite the connoisseur and, and the cook, actually. But anyway... Um, let's talk a little bit about that trip. What was, let's start with Ashley. What was the most memorable part of the trip for you? I think Joe, for us, it was just one meeting more members of RIA. The RIA family has been really good to me over the years. I've met and looked at a lot of things. We, we enjoyed going and having a look at AEML laboratories uh, with Ron Mazer. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed meeting Ken Rothwell from Sunbelt, visiting and seeing what their facilities are like. We don't have anything like that in Australia. So for me, um, I think, you know, coming to America is, is sort of like crystal ball glazing. You know, I can look into the crystal ball. I can see what the future might bring to my country. So we can learn stuff and therefore we can speed up the way technology is happening. So seeing them, seeing the project jobs that we saw down in the Keys, we went down to Key West and saw a, a big job down there that the Roland boys were doing. Uh, uh, Trent from Roland actually helped set it up for us. Had a quick look at uh, about 70 condos that had been afflict affected in the, the recent hurricane you had. And uh, they had a lot of mold. So they were doing a lot of work there on these, on these structures. And Penny, let's let you jump in on that question. Oh, look, it was a great privilege to, to be, you know, to meet some of the RAA people from the States. And it was a great privilege to be shown around in their facilities. I mean, people like Super Restorations, you know, invited us in, um, were happy to spend some time with us. And, and that was a really nice thing. Um, getting to see the projects is actually fantastic. And, you know, just getting to meet people and learning what they do and how it's different to what we do. All right, Cliff, let me let you jump in here for a minute. Well, yeah, I think um, I'd like to talk a little bit about IAQ. You know, I know there was prior IAQ and mold remediation interest in, in Australia years back because when, when I was there, it was a pretty big thing. You know, did this wane? Uh, it seems that now there's this huge resurgence. So what exactly happened? Um. It, that's a bit that's a bit of a tough question i mean it hasn't really waned i just think that there's so much information to get through that we don't know how to really you know garner it and apply it appropriately um iaq is getting a bit of a resurgence now because we're having commercial buildings are being built using building rating systems like neighbors and you know well and there's some of those international ones and so that's giving more exposure to iaq and people are learning. I mean, the internet's a great thing. People get onto Google and go, well, I don't understand. And then think terms like IAQ come up and they're like, oh, there's a, it's a thing. You know, so then it creates interest. What, sorry, what are the most common, you know, here in the States, at least over the last 20 years, um, prior to the last 20 years, I'd say asbestos, lead paint, and radon were the most commonly, you know, uh, most common concerns for consumers in, in the States. And then over the last 20 to 25 years, it seems like things have been dominated by mold. I'm wondering if um, either of you can comment on the Australian market. Is it similar there or are you seeing a little different types of uh, concerns? Uh, I think Joe, uh, it's actually here, Matt. Um, I think Joe that, um, 
we we get things you know you guys are experiencing things quick uh, a lot earlier than us so we're there's a time lag but because of uh, communications google all that sort of stuff we're starting to pick things up a lot quicker so our, our buildings are built slightly different we have a lot uh, a lot of a lot of um, laws around health and safety and, and around um asbestos you know in, in the state that i'm in you can't touch it unless you're government licensed um, a lot of difference there and so I'd therefore I would say that the biggest difference for us is just one the building envelope is built differently in, in the US and two uh, we have a lot more licensing um, as well as you know one simple thing for us you'll never see a building getting built now in Australia uh, forget about domestic but a commercial building being built unless it is completely wrapped in, sec in secure uh, you know scaffolding so you don't see a building go up anymore. What you see is a scaffolding go up, a lot of activity behind it, and then one day the scaffolding starts to come down and you go, oh, it's a six-story building, you know? So the health and safety has become a really, really big thing. Penny, you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I agree with Ashley. And I think, you know, IAQ becomes, you know, people start to become um, a little bit more understanding of, their environment and what they're living in and what they're working in. And, and that's why there's been more of a, um, you know, a thing on IAQ. All right. Well, let's, I think what I'd like to do is kind of start working down the visits you made and, and, and get some of your impressions. First of all, I know you, you did a lab tour. Ashley mentioned this earlier. You, you went to AEML labs, Ron Mazur, good, good friend of the show. Um, as far as Australian, and he's a microbiology lab, by the way, for listeners, I'm sure most of you don't realize that, but uh, they, that's all they do is microbiology. In the Australian market, do you have, I mean, I know there's at least a few microbiology laboratories over there, but I'm assuming there aren't hundreds like there are here in the States. No, that's correct. And, and it was an amazing setup to see. I mean, he had 16 people set up on microscopes, and we don't have anything of that you know, order of magnitude here. What about asbestos samples, uh, volatile organic compounds? Who, um, are, is there a large lab uh, network that does those types of sampling uh, or analysis in Australia? There's a few. There's a couple of labs that I know of, but not many. Okay. Ashley, you want to add anything? Yeah, I'd, just, I'd agree. Um, also, a lot of the asbestos here is, is um, government controlled. So the government has some laboratories that they test stuff with. So if there's a scare somewhere or they go to demolish a building and they find asbestos, the site will get shut down and the government will send inspectors out to actually do a lot of remediate, the, the, the testing to prove whether or whether it is or is not uh, contains asbestos. And what about in the, the restoration world when you had sewage damage or maybe contaminated HVAC systems? Did, did there, was there also a time when the government would come in and, and assist with that type of sampling? No, not that I know of. No. no. I think what, hap what happens over here, Joe, is whatever tends to hit the press, whatever tends to hit the newspapers, whatever happens with, uh, you know, sensationalism, that tends to get on the, the government's fo fo footprint. And then, so they get involved in, in lead, they get involved in asbestos, they get involved in health and safety. Mold really hasn't hit that at this point, uh, but it's certainly growing. Um, there's been some high profile jobs here as well. I'm curious about, uh, you mentioned earlier, Ashley, the building construction and um, is our programs, and I, I think Penny mentioned earlier, the well program and some others, are these green building type programs, are they taking off like they are here in the United States. We see a lot of lead, uh, leadership in energy and environmental design, USGBC, Green Building Council type projects. The National Association of Home Builders has their, uh, their own program. And then you've got people like the Well Building Institute. You've got uh, a, a plethora of, of programs for green building. Do you see that kind of thing occurring in Australia as well? I've seen quite a bit of it. And we have a group called Neighbours, which is, I think, an Australian group. So yeah, that's taking off and that gives um, more knowledge about IAQ because some of those programs have, you know, volatile organic compound ratings and noise ratings and light ratings and sound, you know. So there's all sorts of um, criteria built in those, but sometimes they become just a sales pitch. Like 
we build a building and it's got a six green star rating. So, wow. But then I don't know how it's maintained afterwards. So, you know, it, it, there's some challenges in there, I think. Sounds very similar to, I think, what we see, especially when you mention we don't know how it's maintained afterwards. I think that's a key component that a lot of these programs, and some of them are starting to address, but um, it's an issue. Cliff, let me turn it over to you. Yeah. What other countries uh, besides the United States influence the you know, cleaning, restoration, or an IAQ market in Australia? Um, the UK a little bit, Ashley. Do you... The yeah, the UK a little bit. There's a lot of a bit of a equipment coming out of the UK, dehumidifiers, air filtration equipment. Uh, definitely America. Um, America's where you know dry E started. The, the likes of Phoenix, uh, the big players over in America are all in Australia. So we're getting your products over from America over to Australia very quickly. As soon as they build a new air mover or whatever it might be, a soil filter, a, a, a fil uh, air scrubber. They'll, you know, convert it to 240 volt because we're a different voltage. That's a big thing for us. And then they'll get it out here quite quickly. So we're getting the, the technology quickly. We're getting the chemicals quickly. It just takes a while for us with our different laws to, to, to bring things up. IAQ here is growing tremendously. The association has now formed a chapter in Australia. That's growing, uh, which is really good. They're also coming along to the, the RAA conference that we're running in Australia in June. So stay tuned for that. What about Scandinavia or other parts of Europe? Um, any influence? Because they do a lot of research, you know, on building uh, science and construction and mold, et cetera. We have a bit of, there's some equipment coming out from German, the German build equipment that we've got coming out here now. Um, and there's always Chinese equipment coming out. But uh, apart from that, I'm not really sure. Okay, thanks. You know, another um, site that you visited or another part of your, your visit here in the States you were going through and you went to um, a high-end water mold intrusion site. And I'm wondering, Penny, I know you kind of specialize in mold right now, um, although you have a, an extensive background in the water damage world. What, if any, differences did you see between the way they were doing this high-profile job and the way the typical job is done in Australia? Well, sometimes in Australia, it's about how quickly can we get, you know, people back into the home or can we, you know, move on to the next bit or build, start building the kitchen before containment's even brought down. But these guys in this particular high-end job were very much about we're not, we're not moving on to a next stage until the, this stage is completed and done right. And they were monitoring, monitoring the air and they were monitoring their equipment. You know, they were really going all out. I also noticed in your... Um bio that you do both assessment and remediation is that is that correct yeah and and here in the states there's always been a controversy about well should you do the assessment on on a job where you do the remediation and so on and and, and that's kind of gone back and forth over the years although the iicrc s520 the mold remediation standard kind of you know uh shies away from that or, or is actually pretty adamant about not having the same person doing the assessment and the remediation on the project. Do you have similar uh, concerns in the Australian market? Do people, um, you know, question you about doing both assessment and remediation? Look, absolutely. And, you know, if it's a really, really small job, you know, you can't make it bigger than what it is. If it's one room and it's tiny, then there's no point involving 15 people in this process. You know, the homeowner just wants you to get in, get the job done and get out. And by involving, you know, separating out all the, the, the parts, that makes it very difficult. It becomes a three week process as opposed to, can we get in, do this job and, you know, get out. Um, Obviously, bigger jobs, you would separate out the separation of, you know, accountability in terms of who's done the assessment, who's done the work, and who's done the post-remediation verification. Sure. Bigger jobs, more high-profile jobs, absolutely. But the little ones, we That's have so to you know, in the States, we, Joe and I will giggle and we'll laugh about the S520 as being the indoor environmental professional full employment act. But, you know, it's, it just has always bothered me that, you know, in, in a fire restoration situation, you trust the restoration contractor to come in, assess the damage, do the repairs. 
Uh, same thing in the United States with pest control. They can't sell a house without a pest inspection. They hire somebody to do it. If the pests are there, they have to do the treatment. If they're not there, they don't. It just seems that this little niche, uh, you know, is reserved for, uh, you know, indoor environmental professionals. And it, it's just always, uh, I'm a free enterprise guy. It's always bothered me. Ashley? Yeah. Thoughts on, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Penny. I, I understand where you're coming from, but sometimes, you know, when it's, you, when you go to, you get a phone call from a homeowner and then you build a relationship with the homeowner and they don't want anybody else in their home. Yep. Yep. You know, it's like we trust you, we understand you, we believe, you know, and so sometimes there's that situation happening. Oh, no, I agree. I think that the homeowner should be comfortable with who does it. I think they should make the choice uh, of, of who does it, and they should have someone that's going to advocate for their property and for their interest. I've, I have no problem with that. But, you know, the fact that someone took a course and puts IEP behind their name I don't necess and doesn't necessarily have a lot of restoration experience. I mean, there are people in the United States that are – consulting on projects that have very, very little hands-on restoration and even less common sense. Well, there's some scopes of works that I've been given by IEPs that I just won't follow. Right. Hmm. I've walked away have, have, are, is different. there a kind of like an IEP? Um, I don't know. Is there, is there a good number of IEPs working in Australia or do most people do both? Um, no, we have some IEPs, but, you know, there's not a plethora of them. So people that live in the, you know, remote parts of, of Australia, you know, some of the country towns, don't have access to an IEP. I see. Ashley, what about your experience there? Are you, uh, what are your thoughts on that topic of third party on every project? I think, I think, as Penny said, it really does come down to the job. You know, who am I working for? Am I working for the homeowner? Is there an insurance company involved? I think the size of the job matters, um, the complexity of the job, and I think that's where a good um, you know, IAQ guy is, uh, is going to look at it and go, yeah, this is okay, I can manage it, as long as he's explaining those risks to the, to the person who he's working for and they're accepting those risks, then by all means, you know, they could do some of that work themselves. If, it, As Penny said, it's a small job. As a job becomes bigger, commercial, there's other parties involved, You've got some uh, IEPs that are writing scopes that just don't make sense. Uh, but I'm sure that happens in America too. Uh, so yep. it's just a matter as the market grows is, um, is trying to keep that, uh, the associations involved, keeping the professionals in there and making sure that everyone can uh, do the job properly and not get stuck with uh, too many middlemen in the middle who are making decisions but actually aren't paying for anything and causing drama for everyone. You know, one, I think one primary difference that we should point out really is litigation in the United States versus litigation in Australia. I mean, we have certain states in the United States, New York, uh, California, that are very, very, very litigious. And um, I know that your legal system is, is somewhat different. You know, in the United States, we can sue anybody for, for anything, and there's no consequences. Uh, whether we prevail or we don't. And I believe the legal system's a little bit different uh, in Australia. If you could comment on that and comment on, you know, IAQ or, or mold litigation. Well, look, some and of the, there is definitely some big cases out there. And as a contractor or as a restoration technician, I absolutely have to manage risk in my jobs. And if I think that there's a risk that something can go awry or something there's something funky about the job, then absolutely I'm, I'm going to get in a third party and, and you know, manage my risk that way. But, uh, Ashley? Yeah, look, the, the legal system's definitely different. Obviously, we're based on a Westminster system, a British system. Uh, the big, single biggest thing that, that surprises most people and that probably cuts out a number of the frivolous lawsuits is that if you want to sue me, that's okay. But if you lose, you pay my costs. Mm -hmm. That changes things quickly. Hey, let me show sure us the next um, visit, I believe. And this, this caught my eye because it's a big issue here in the States. You apparently visited, uh, I guess it's Gene Raffa, uh, who owns a company called Before You Buy Real Estate Inspections. And um, 
talk to him about what he does for his clients. This is an area that's really difficult here in the States for, for our, um, both real estate agents, brokers, um, home inspectors, you name it. And that's mold on real estate transactions. And I'm assuming that's probably part of what Gene does is he um, helps people with real estate transactions and inspections on the typical home inspection here in the States. Mold is not necessarily um, addressed other than they'll note any, you know, visible damages. They may note moisture issues, et cetera, but they don't necessarily start to investigate the extent of any mold issues. Um, first off, I'd like to know, is it similar in Australia? Do you have home inspectors that go out and do this type of thing? And what do they do when it comes to mold related issues? Wow. Actually, here that, yeah, Ashley, I'll give you a quick comment. Um, they, they'll have a tick, a tick and flick list, and if they see mold or they see pest or whatever, they they'll just tick and flick and say there's evidence of this, there's evidence of that, and they'll basically move on. It's the homeowner's responsibility to do stuff. In our case, that's why we we met with Gene. What a really nice guy. One man show um, works in I'm going to say the West Palm Beach area. Um, really cares about his clients has got a lot of repeat clients from doing what he does i think he gets a bit more involved in just doing the inspections he's there to help them with the mold problems and becomes a consultant with them uh, and that's a very different you don't see that in australia uh, but certainly growing penny yeah i've um I, I agree actually there's there's a lot of um you know people ring up and say look i've bought a house and i say you know did you do a pre-purchase inspection and they send it to me to look at and I'll look at it, but it's very much a tip and flick. And I've also been getting calls for the last couple of years saying to me, look, I want to buy this property. Will you come and have a look at it for me from a mold point of view before we buy it? So, you know, that's an interesting niche in the market. People ask me to look at the homes and, you know, to help them determine whether they should buy this thing or the risk of the mold, I suppose. But, you know, there's a fine line because I can't walk into one of these properties that are displayed beautifully for sale with all my equipment and go, well, you know, there's moisture here and moisture here and, you know, there's only so much you can do. It's a, it's a difficult situation for, for people here and all over the world, you know, when you're selling your home. Um, do you, you know, I'm, I deal with it a lot and um, it's tough. How far do you go to evaluate this? What about, again, the legal system is different. So if I sold a home with, with mold in it, and let's say, what'd you call it, the tick and flick list there, Ashley? Um, <laughs> if it wasn't on the tick and flick list, list um, and I sold it, and I knew even though I sold the home that there was a, a moisture issue, um, could the new buyer come back on me? He could. Um, it, it's, it's probably buyer beware. <laughs> So that okay. if you're the buyer, you cop it. Um, so it's you, it's your job to do the due diligence. So if you're um, inspector, you would employ the inspector to do the due diligence. He would do his report. If it, nothing showed up, then that would be it. If something did show up and he didn't see it, um, then I guess you'd be trying to sue his public liability insurance, and you probably have a you know it'd probably be fun to try and do that. Okay, interesting. And, and Gene, Gene and Gene was a really good guy. Uh, and if, you, if you went after him and, and you failed, would you then have to pay his costs? Possibly. Possibly. Interesting. Very interesting. All right. Let's move on to the next one. You also visited, uh, let's see, Dan Vargas, Super Restoration, office plant and a tour in the Miami area. I think we got a photo actually of their um, training facility here. Let's see. What, uh, what did you pick up from that visit? Ashley, start with you. Um, what a great uh, company. Um, you know, RA members, um, they are spotlessly clean. I, I, at home here, I always talk about, you know, when you, uh, that's, that's a photo of down in Key West, that one. Um, but yeah, there we are. Uh, great company, young, vibrant, uh, clean as a whistle. I've never seen a cleaning facility so clean. Um, and they seem that one of the things he did say, that they don't do vendor programs, they only deal directly with a customer. And that was interesting. You don't see a lot of that in Australia. So that's what struck us as being very impressive. His facility itself was amazing, uh, huge, um, a lot of equipment, very, very well maintained. Um, and, you know, their whole office seemed to have a really good vibe about being positive and being, uh, being a successful company. And it was very impressive to have a look. Interesting. Penny, do you have anything you'd like to add? 
these guys were amazing. They were very yeah, clean, neat. But you know what strikes me with these, this company is they're dedicated to sticking in their lane. They know what they like to do. They know what they do best and they're doing that. They're not sort of drifting off thinking, oh, I'll double over here and double over there. They, they're dedicated to, to, to water loss, water mitigation. And they're also, given the size of their um, training room, they're dedicated to higher learning. And, and, you know, making sure that people understand and doing things properly. So they're, they're expanding their um, training room by, what, 3,000 square feet? Actually, was it something like that? Yep. Yeah, so yes. they're, they're making it bigger. So they're, they're expanding their whole learning side. But, yeah, very dedicated and very focused. And, you know, Ashley, you bring up the program work. Um, here in the States, that's been a, a huge area of uh, discussion. I would say for the last, I don't even, maybe even f at least five years, maybe 10 years that um, there are specific programs that carriers have where you're an approved uh, program provider and you go out and you give certain pricing and, and um, you get more, more work as a result of that. Do you have a similar uh, system in, in Australia? Yes, we do. Exactly the same, probably slightly tweaked. Um, we have similar, very, very similar program work. The difference over here would be the fact that we're probably five to ten years behind you. So a lot of restoration companies in Australia are doing a lot of program work. They're probably getting, you know, up until a couple of years ago, probably getting 70 to 80 percent of their work from programs. And as it's flipped in America um, over the last 10 or 15 years, it's starting to change here now. You know, and it's the big question I always ask, who am I working for? Am I working for the insurance company or the property owner? That's, and I think that's a question here as well, although, you know, right. legally working for the, the property owner, but when you get into this program business, you end up um, with kind of a, a dual loyalty, I think. Penny, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, no, what Ashley says is true. And, you know, this feeds into the complexity of, you know, how many people do you have on the job? When you're doing TPA work, or as we call it, or vendor programs, you have less control over you know, who you have IEPs. As a private contractor, you know, finding my own work and doing private work is I have a little bit more control or a little bit more sway with the customer when I go into the home and I sort of try and lay it out for them. But uh, yeah, TPA work, having that as a large percentage of your income is risky. And, um, you know, Ashley, you indicate there is a lot of uh, TPA work and it sounded like, Penny, you were... Um somewhat impressed that uh, maybe both of you that the the super restoration folks they don't do that kind of work they just do work yeah. directly to the owner is that something you're considering you know, maybe implementing a little more in your own business well i, yes. I don't i don't do tpa work at all okay ashley yes we, we've got larger commercial clients um, we've walked away from some of the program work it's, we're going through that flip in Australia right now where you know, the restoration companies are going, this is all getting too hard. Um, unfortunately, that's the way it is. Um, and so people are moving to go to commercial arrangements, commercial agreements, emergency response programs, uh, pretty much similar following the market over in America. Hmm. All right, we've it, got it's, a break here. Before we get to the, the large project, we want to talk a little bit about the 70 plus condo project you looked at in Key West, see how things are coming along down there per your perspective. And I, I know you also visited with Sunbelt Rentals, but before we do, we want to stop and thank our sponsors. IAQ Radio would like to thank our association sponsors. The Indoor Air Quality Association, a nonprofit multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Visit them at iaqa.org. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, who use advanced sensor software technology and embedded computers to provide superior environmental test instrumentation. Visit them, wolfsense.com. IAQ marquee sponsors are. John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. 
Healthy Indoor Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions are available at IAQ.net. Particles Plus, engineers and manufacturers feature rich particle counters, air quality monitoring, instrumentation, and vacuum pump technology. ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Okay, we're back for the second half of our interview, and, and we were kind of running down your list of stops, and I, I really wanted to save a little time here after halftime to talk about this uh, project with 70-plus condos in the West. I, I'm assuming um, I didn't get a chance to talk too much about this. This was a result of the recent hurricanes we had come through. Um, first of all, just your impression on um, – how the recovery is coming along in that area. These were in Key West, if I'm not mistaken. Ashley, let's start with you. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we went for a nice big long drive. It was a wonderful drive down there. Never been to there before, um, but it was certainly amazing. Um, obviously, it's from, it was from the hurricane. Uh, the, this building uh, was being, uh, we were showed through with, by some of the guys from Roland, uh, the Roland companies and Trent Darden. And Brian Speckles was there, were the guys that put us in the direction and they had an on-site manager named Joe who, who showed us around, which was really good. Um, yes, definitely. It was all a lot of mould. It had a lot of, um, uh, I think the water had come up and it had gone through the properties. The lower levels had been uh, wet. They'd been locked up with all the hurricane uh, things on the windows and that had caused them to get wet inside and they had a lot of mould. And Penny can add a bit more, I'm sure. Yeah, they were all these condos were the same layout, so there was three levels. So there's obviously more damage on the bottom, but you know the, the upper levels got you know subsequent damage from just you know humidity and just you know high moisture, etc. But uh, yeah, it was an interesting thing to see you know the levels that they were having to go to to build back. It was I'm good. curious. Were were most at this point in time? I'm assuming most of the wet materials had already been cut out. Um, yeah and that you were pretty much down to stud. What type of construction was it? Ashley, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, it was up, up off the ground, so I'm going to use layman terms, and our Australian terms are probably a bit different than yours. It was timber, stud walls. Um, it had a cladding on the outside. The lower level, they'd taken some of the, the external cladding off. They were replacing decks. You can see from the photos, it was, it was quite interesting just to see what they were doing. Um, had a lot of problems with mould inside, so they're removing some of the drywall. Uh, that you know, obviously they've done all the removal. They're now into replacement, uh, and they were bringing in all the, the tradesmen to, uh, to the carpenters to do all the replacement work. They treated all the, the floors with. Um, uh, I saw it was the yeah, five below. Yeah, product, and um, it was really really interesting to see what they're doing. It's a big job. Penny, I'm wondering, you know, you, you do a lot of uh, mold-related work. Anything that you can – well, first, uh, can you comment on the use of um, different disinfecting products in Australia? Is it very similar to what you saw here in the United States? And you mentioned the FiberLock product. That's a pretty well, common used one. Well, we, we had the FiberLock here in Australia. Um, so we didn't actually get to – on this particular project, we didn't get to see – what disinfectant products that we're using, but you know we have most of the ones that you have here, or a fair a fair number, and they're used in you know varying ways and varying methods. But um, I, I found it interesting that you used the fiber lock on the flooring to seal the flooring. What type of flooring was it? Is it wood or concrete? Um, actually, I don't know because I, um, I can't remember now. But it wood was, it was wood. It looks like it was stick built, Joe, with with wood. Penny, I've got a question for you on the antimicrobial stuff. In Australia, if if a restoration contractor or mold remediation contractor is going to be using an antimicrobial, do they have a uh, have the client sign some sort of document to permit them to use it? No. Okay. Well, I don't think. I, I, well, I'm glad you don't because I don't think you should have to. Because when we do fire restoration, we don't get the customer to sign off on what we're going to use to deodorize or what we're going to use to paint or rebuild or finishes or whatever. I just think it unnecessarily raises uh, awareness. I have been asked by some clients who are highly sensitized or sensitive right. to everything 
you know, um, are you using anything toxic in my home? And generally my answer is, well, I can give you the FDS, but anything I use is going to be less toxic than the mold that's in your home. One of the things that we would do in order to, or some of the things we would do in order to deal with that, you know, number one might be to use something that's fragrance free. And number yeah. two, uh, I would, we would do a sniff test with them. What I would do is I would let them sniff it you know, from the container, we would have a blotter strip that we would dip into it. And this would be done outside their home. You know, here, go in your car, sniff this, go in my car, sniff this. If this is okay, fine. If this isn't okay, you know, let me know before we I've use done, it. I've done that with customers. I've actually right. taken them out and said, look, this is what I want to use. You Correct. let me know if you're, you're comfortable with this. Right. That's the best way to do it. And now, the last visit, I believe, or, or well, the last one on my list is you, you went and saw the uh, Sunbelt rental folks uh, maybe more than once. And I'm, I'm curious, do you have similar types of uh, rental companies in, in Australia that service the restoration and abatement type industries? We have some, but they're much smaller. They're not on the same scale as Sunbelt by, by any stretch of the imagination. I think we've got a picture here of uh, your visit to Sunbelt. Um, Ashley, what are your thoughts? Is that something that you see maybe as a possibility down the road? I think the, there are companies now in Australia that are renting equipment. You've got to remember it's a population-based thing. Uh, and, you know, we've got 25 million people. You've got over 330 million people. So mm -hmm. it's, it's much, much scaled down. Um, distance is another problem, you know, with, with everything being so far apart, you can't just, there's not, there's no, we're a few cities with more than, you know, two or three million people in them. So getting gear around and moving equipment is difficult, but they're there, they're growing. Um, you know, we're following your market as we, we continue to do with a lot of things, uh, different brands. Um, uh, but I know, you know, it was interesting to have a look at Sunbelt and just see their setup and how they cater for different sec sec sections of the, of the market from the builders through the humidity control generators. Uh, you know, you have a lot of hurricanes that tend to hit Florida. So I was surprised that, you know, the number of generators, you just can't, we just never see the volume that you have over the cooker. Hmm. I've got a question for you, Ashley. I'm, I'm sorry I don't know the answer to this. What, what's the energy business like in Australia? Do they, I mean, do you have oil in Australia? Do you have natural gas in Australia? Well, lots of oil and lots more natural gas. Right now, they, they're mining natural gas everywhere and exporting it everywhere. And our local price of using natural gas for heating has gone through the roof in the last few years. Same as electricity costs have gone ballistic, 50% increase in electricity fees in the last few years. The green movement is happening a lot too. We've got um, a lot of press here recently where uh, Elon Musk has put out, you know, a hundred million dollar largest battery in the world or something uh, down in South Australia to, to help them with the problems they're having uh, when the wind's not blowing and the fans aren't turning and they're, they're phasing out. What, what I think we've made a mistake in Australia and appears to be, and I'm no expert, is they started shutting down the coal-fired uh, fire. Uh, electric plants, you know, generating plants, but didn't have anything else in place to take it over. So there's been a bit of a problem. We also don't have any nucle nuclear at all. The reason, the reason that I asked is that up in Canada, um, they had, you know, severe, you know, in, in the past they've had, you know, severe flooding and all the equipment from companies like Sunbelt up there was all deployed. So there was no equipment available. And what they found, the reason I asked about the energy, is that oftentimes some of the same types of equipment, the generators, uh, et cetera, are used in oil and gas exploration and, and in mining and, and so on and so forth. So the fact that they're doing this in your country, you know, there may be a, a resource there you know, in the event that you need it and just you know, someplace for you to look. Yeah, I agree. I agree, Cliff. Um, there's, there is a lot of use in the mining field. The problem for us is it's such a long way away from where people live. Uh, so trying to reuse it. The other thing, of course, is different voltage. So an air mover doesn't work. An American air mover doesn't work in Australia. Um, generators run on different hertz and different voltage, uh, even to the point that the diesel fuel, uh, how do you say it, diesel, yeah, diesel. fuel that you, you, that you use doesn't work in, in our generators. <laughs> Why? Um, you have, I've seen this, it's like red. Does that, does that mean anything to you? Yeah, it's I'll explain. Colored what... red. 
No, I'll ex- different self, different no, self I'll, ex- I'll, ex- I'll explain what it means. What happens is in the United States, there's a tax on there by the government. And what happens is if it's used for transportation, there's a tax. If it's used for farming, there isn't a tax. And what they do is they dye it so they know that this is supposed to be taxed or not supposed to be taxed. So they're different colors. So that's how they can catch you pretty easily if you're using, uh, you know, farming diesel for uh, transportation because there's a significant difference in, co- in cost, well over a dollar a gallon. Easy. Yeah, so, we're uh, looking probably around five to six dollars a gallon for right. for uh, diesel in Australia. But uh, you know, our diesel is higher as well. But what I'm saying is is the different yeah, tax. The tax is is, is well over a dollar a gallon. So. Oh, we, we have a similar. We have a similar. We don't color it. Um, if you're, for instance, a farmer, uh, you can get a diesel rebate. So you keep all your receipts, and you can actually claim it back. So you don't get red diesel right. or anything like that. It's just buy at the end of the year, or yeah, you know, during the quarter, you can claim it back on your your tax. You know, in in the states, one of the other things we have issues that create our fuel shortages here is different geographies in the United States have mandated by the government different formulas for fuel, and you're not allowed to take it from one place to another. Even though it'll run in your car, you know there are certain additives in California, there's certain additives in Pennsylvania. You can't use Pennsylvania gas in Ohio, and, and, oh, and so on and so forth. Just unnecessary complication. I, I would agree. I've, I see it too. I, I was quite impressed when I went to New Jersey, quite like the area, but I couldn't fill my own yeah, car up yeah, with I'm gasoline. Right. That's right. <laughs> couldn't believe it. We just could not believe. And it was. And the funny thing was, it was cheaper in New Jersey than what it was in Philadelphia. Right. Yeah, and they filled it for you. Let's um, I want to notify the the Restoration Industries Global Watchdog. We're going to bring you on in a, in just a moment for the roundup. I got one more question I want to throw out to um, Ashley and. And Penny, I, I, you know, you've, you've been coming over here for many years. Um, there's a lot of um, tumult in the uh, uh, restoration world right now. There's a, you know, it's changing. People are having a harder time making the type of living they used to make in the past. Uh, you've got the programs we talked about before. I'm wondering from your outsider's perspective, what do you think about in general the state of the United States restoration industry. Let's start with you, Penny. State is the industry. Well, I think you're going through a bit of change as well. Um, I think you're having similar struggles. You know, I don't know that um, you're quite as united as you think. (laughs) People are off doing their own thing and uh, really pushing the boundaries, much like a kid pushes the boundaries with a parent, trying new things and seeing what works and what doesn't. Interesting. And, and Ashley, what are your thoughts? Um, the things that I see, are, you know, who's the customer? That's always a big thing. And I see there's a lot of turmoil over who is the customer. Is it the insurance company or the guy who pays the check or the homeowner or the, the property owner? That's the first thing. The second thing I see is getting paid seems to be a really big thing. Um, I can't see the point in doing work if you can't get paid for it. And the third thing would, that, you know, is quite controversial is the overhead and profit. This is completely alien to us. I've never heard of it until I came to America. Um, you know, to me, your charges become your charges and they are built in. And to think that you can suddenly strip out overhead and, pro- overhead and profit, to think that you can put a percentage number on it as well. You know, every business is different. And I don't know of any other industry anywhere else that, that strips out things like that. So I think that's a, a point that um, needs to be addressed as an industry. Um, and I think the more discussion groups like RAA are doing on it, uh, we're certainly looking at what you're doing over there and saying, hey, well, we don't want that to come over here, so we're going to be really proactive on certain things. But those are my big three, my, my three things I see. So you don't want to see that overhead and profit replicated in Australia. It's typically what, 10 and 10, as I understand it, 10% and 10%. You're building that already into your pricing. Sure. And so it should be. There's no other business where you, you do that um, that I'm aware of. Um, and also I'm now hearing it's 10 and 5 and 5 and 5 and 0 and 5 and 0 and 0. So mm-hmm. it, it seems like a game that's only going down. And I call that a race to the bottom um, and companies are moving out of it. 
I think that that sounds like a quote for the show, a race to the bottom, Ashley. I like that. <laughs> All right, let's go to the roundup. Move him on, hit him up, hit him up, move him on, move him on, hit him up, go high. Cut him out, ride him in, ride him in, let him out, cut him out, ride him in, go Clip, I want to go over to you because I, I, I've kind of been skipping around a little bit here. I want to make sure there weren't any that, you know, we had talked about before the show that we didn't get a chance to ask. No, but I, I do have a comment that uh, I want to make for Ashley and, and, and for Penny. You know, I, I, I've been at this rodeo for a long time, 40 years. And the thing that I find absolutely scary is the, lo the loss of information. Uh, you know, things that restores knew and did 15, 20 years ago are like forgotten and people just don't know how to do it anymore. And, you know, they think that, you know, some new machine comes out and that that's the solution for, because it's new and, you know, I, you know, whatever you can do in your country to, you know, preserve number one, the history and, and preserve the methodology, particularly those things that work. I think is very, very important. And, you know, sad part is, you know, in the United States, I think that fire restoration has pretty much become a lost art. I, I hear you. Uh, um, Cliff, my comment on that is that I, as much as I love um, evolution or evolving technologies and methodologies, sometimes the basics just work. Absolutely. Yep. Ashley, isn't that the KISS principle? Isn't that the KISS principle? Keep it simple, stupid. Right. <laughs> All right. Do we I have totally agree with you, Cliff. Industries, Global, Watchdog. Are you on the line, Pete Consigli? Yeah, guys. How you doing today? Good. Great to have you, Pete. Um, thought we, we appreciate you uh, helping us line this up. And uh, I'm sure Ashley and, and Penny really appreciated your uh, tour guide experience down in Florida. Any thoughts, uh, comments, follow-ups from today's show? Well, you know, it's funny. L listening to Cliff talk about this uh, the fact that um, we've, we've lost a generation or well, institutional memory, you know. I know many of the listeners on the show are familiar with Steve Rick's summer camp and quite a few of them probably attended. You know, that, that was Joe Steve Rick's the thing that, you know, when Cliff and, and me first met Joe and uh, – you know, we brought him to ASCR back in the day before it was rebranded to RAA. That was something that struck a chord with us is that he felt that every 20 years, the next generation had to relearn what the generation before them already knew. And that was, in essence, the beginning of summer camp is to try to preserve that, that memory. Um, it's funny that, that Cliff talks about, you know, the fire damage kind of being a lost art in the U.S. because one of the things that the Aussies are struggling with big time now is how to deal with fire and, uh, restoration of fire and smoke damaged buildings. And um, there's a huge void there in that marketplace. You know, they, they've they really, you know, caught on on all the water and the drying and the mold and, you know, all, all of those issues. But it seems that there's this void. And in and in Australia, um, they, they I don't think they're, they're not as uh, on top of it, if you would, uh, with the contents and kind of the interior smoke in fire damage restoration, which for many years is the core part of, you know, most restoration contractors. Um, I, I mean, they, they have the equipment out there and, uh, you know, some of the different systems and granted those things have been out there, but from the standpoint of the insurance companies and a lot of these uh, consultants that get called in to, to specify the work, they don't really have a handle on it. And they're finding that they're, they're replacing uh, you know, doing a lot of reconstruction work that's probably unnecessary. So I think there's, you're going to see a focus in the future to, to try to educate the marketplace, the insurers, um, the builders, and other people who are crossing over and entering into restoration. And look, that, that, that was the same kind of dynamic that existed in the U.S. for many years, in Canada, and certainly in, in the U.K. You know, the thing in the U.K. is there has always – there's never been a full-service contractor uh, – uh, in, in the UK, that either either builders or the restoration guys. We're in the US and Canada, you know, you have a variety of models. I think we're going to see in Australia what's going to happen. I, I think it's in development now to find out how that market plays out with you. 
move to full service models or whether whether there's a separation. But nonetheless, if there's going to be reconstruction work uh, involved, then the, the people that are doing that need to understand the technology and different procedures and methodologies that, that, that can be done. Uh, you know, li listening to Ashley talk about the, this overhead and profit thing has been has been a, a bug in my craw for many, many years. Um, you know, I, I, I think I, I've been speaking for quite a while that I think the market should move to what's called net pricing. And uh, I think it's fallen on deaf ears. I, I think all this drama about overhead and profit and all the different numbers that Ashley was alluding to is just a bunch, you know, well, Marty King would call it the bovine extra mention. It's just a bunch of BS at the end of the day. There's no other business or industries that I know of that deal with that unless you're dealing with public service type work where you're doing things on true cost and then they add percentages on top and open bidding processes and things of that nature. The only other industry I've ever seen that done is an automotive industry where they may have to send a particular part out somewhere and they may put some sublet percentage on there to handle it. But other than that, it, 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 you know, the cost is what the cost is. And some of the some of the franchises over the years who started out in the reconstruction area and then moved into restoration struggled with, with this with the insurance companies because in 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 the in the reconstruction model they always had this overhead and profit. Once they moved to the restoration model, the, the insurance company said, "No, no, that's supposed to be included." Well, it's just very confusing and and it's just stupid. I mean, this, this is how much it should cost to paint the building. Or this is how much it should cost to put these in or to do that or something else. And I think that the industry has gotten very lazy with this over and profit. And this is this has caused a lot of the issues that deals with pricing and arguing over the money. And we don't want to pay this. and We want to take some back. I, I think the over and profit has been a crutch. And I, I think it, 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 it should be wrapped and included. I'm not, I'm not saying that people are supposed to work for free and not make their margins. But I think it's gotten complicated. But, you know, uh, trying to change it. You know, it's, it's, it's probably the equivalent of trying to get legislation through Congress. It's something that uh, isn't going to be easy, and I don't know. I guess we're just going to continue to struggle with it. Um, but in any case, uh, I think it's interesting that the, the Aussies, uh, you know, um, I, I think can, uh, you know, if their market will evolve and they will, will grow faster uh, based on, you know, lessons that have already been learned in the marketplace. Um, I always, uh, you know, enjoy visiting with them. Um, you know, we have the REA's got the first annual conference that's going to be put on there in June uh, on the Sunshine Coast, beautiful area uh, north of Brisbane, where actually lives in the state of Queensland. And um, obviously a lot of the American and Canadian uh, suppliers will be out there, locals also. Um, one of the things, Joe, you may want to put this date down, uh, June 8th, which is a Friday. It'll be uh, 2 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, June 9th in Australia, but maybe we could do a live show. If I can have a couple of these guys either stay up late or get up early. Uh, Chuck Violin going out. Uh, Chris Schumacher will be out there. Uh, Gary Leuben. Uh, uh, Chris Munchak, obviously, director of RAA. And um, it'll be interesting. They're doing it in conjunction with the IEQA people that Ashley and Penny had mentioned. Um, I think uh, I think that's exciting. Of course, IQA and RA have a great partner relationship here in the states, and uh, I think that's extended over into Australia. So I think I think that's all good. And um, you know, the the world is uh, we live in a global global society now, and um, uh, you know, it takes more than the notion to keep us apart. And I think we all could learn from each other. So anyway, I thank you guys for uh, for the you know for uh, doing the show. Hopefully. Um, some lessons to learn for everybody, no matter which side of the ocean you live on. And uh, enjoyed showing you, you guys around, spending some time with you, uh, Penny and Ashley, and including that, that Sunday brunch that we had down there. We, we found a place, and we had a, we had a brunch down at South Beach, and we found out that they, uh, they actually have a restaurant in Singapore, so it really is a small world. And we've got a <laughs> There, Pete. I don't know if it's the right one or not, but no, it that's the good. deli. <laughs> that's the deli. All right. Well, thank you, Pete, as always. Um, any final thoughts, Ashley? Let's start with you, and then we're going to go to Penny. And uh, I think Pete wraps it up really well. Yeah, Joe and Cliff. Anything I'd like to say is thank you for having us. Um, it's great that your show is 
move to this uh, live look. It looks fantastic. Uh, congratulations on all the work you've done and thank you for all the effort you've done over the time. We've had a great time and it's great to get to know you guys and hopefully we'll be back over there soon or maybe next year you might be back over here when we do some more stuff with IAQ. That would be great. We uh, really enjoy having you on and uh, look forward to talking again soon. Penny, uh, before I give you get your last thoughts, um, you're on the IAQA chapter board over there. Is IAQA sending one over, anyone over for the June conference? Uh, no. Um, actually, I'm not on the board at the moment. Um, I've, I've, I've done some time and I've, I've moved off. Um, okay. I don't think anybody from the IAQ community is coming over from America. And, uh, but this is only our first show, so maybe we might use it as a goal for next year. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's expensive to send people and, you know, it's times are a little tough and this is the first one. So maybe uh, next year would be good. What are your, any final thoughts before we go, Penny? Look, it's just been a great pleasure um, to, to, to be on the show. And it was, um, we're very grateful for Pete for showing us around. Uh, and it was great, great to go to another trip to America. And I'm looking forward to the next time I come. Okay, and C's, uh, Cliff, any final thoughts? I, I do, Joe. You know, I was complaining about, you know, the state of the art of the industry, and I think there are a couple of reasons for it. Uh, I, I think what happened is the industry got so involved with standards and the importance of standards and the importance of specific standards that what they did is they, ad, 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 they abdicated decision-making to the standard, to a book. And you know, in the old days, the contractor would call the shots. Now, well, on se page 17, category, you know, paragraph six, or whatever, it says, I must do this, or I must do that, or whatever. And that's really where I think we went south. You know, we, and you know, the next thing we did is we abdicated our pricing to the computer. And okay. uh, not just the common sense goes out the window when you start quoting chapters of a, of a standard. I'm sorry, I didn't. Can you repeat? Common sense tends to get thrown out the window when we start, you know, quoting chapters of a, a standard. Understood. Well, in that experience, you know, you can put somebody in a three-day class, like some of the organizations that over, you know, review these invoices, and um, they just look at the standard and say, "Hey, you know, you should have had this instead of that," and uh, you know, it it really dumbs it down quite a bit. Although, you know. I think that's a great show topic, actually, Cliff. Um, you know, standards, how they help and how they hurt. And um, I think it's, you know, obviously there are, there are certainly good things about having standards, but uh, you've got to, when you, when you put them together, you have to keep in mind those drawbacks that you just mentioned. I think it's a great point, and we'll have to see if we can't have a, uh, a future show on that. You know, but if, if you look at what are the reasons that drive this, you know, why do we have these standards? I mean, is it for the good of the world? You know, I, I think the two things that drive it are money and power. I mean, those are the, and control. I mean, that's really what drives it because you have one organization that wants to write all the standards for everything that we do. Why? You know, it's this, oh, they have all these volunteers that, you know, just are so giving of time that, you know, given to church isn't enough, they have to, you know, they have to do this, but. Well, I mean, I think they would argue and I'll, I'll throw the argument out that, you know, what they're trying to do is um, level the playing field to some degree and make sure that uh, the consumer has something to look at to ensure that they're not getting subpar work, um, you know, and that, and that the industry um, members are coming together to kind of regulate themselves before the government comes in to regulate them. You know, you know what I mean? If we don't pull our act together and do proper fire restoration or proper water damage restoration, and, and there's enough complaints from consumers, then you might get big brother coming in and regulating you. So I, I think it's a great topic and we'll definitely uh, look forward to talking about it more in the future. All right. Well, this is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks to Penny Trela and, uh, of course, to Ashley Easterby, our two guests from Down Under today. I know it's got to be getting really late, and, and we really, really appreciate both of you staying up so long to, to join us and uh, look forward to talking to you again in the not-too-distant future. Of course, to our 
uh, contributor in the restoration industry's global watchdog, Pete Consigli, John Faith at the controls. John, you got to have faith at the controls. My co-host, the Z-Man, and most importantly, our growing group of loyal listeners. Please come back next Friday at noon for the next episode of IAQ Radio. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening. 